Hi everyone, this is John Gardner, Professor of Mechanical and Biomedical Engineering at Boise State, and welcome to Part 3 of Module 6 on Computer Simulations, part of our larger course in Dynamic Modeling and Control of Engineering Systems. In the first two modules, we introduce the concept of a simulation, what it is and why you need it, and, uh, and then in the second one we talked about actually generating or putting together a very simple simulation of a mass spring damper system. So we're going to continue on in the same vein, and in this um, in this module, we're going to we're going to talk about modifying the simulation and, and trying out different things with it, but also some some kind of tips and tricks about running a simulation as they get more complicated. Tracking things like parameter values um, can be pretty complicated, and so there's a few things here that are are, uh, are again aren't often covered in. Uh, introductory texts or in tutorials that I think you'll find very useful. So uh, recall our simulation. It was a spring mass damper system. We defined three parameters, the mass, the spring stiffness, and the damping uh, coefficient, and defined one variable, the position or displacement of the mass. So, and we ended up with this simulation, very simple simulation, and we only looked at its response to initial conditions. So it had two integrators, three gain blocks, and a scope and a summing junction. So let's let's take the a very simple modification. Say, okay, now we have an external force that drives this system. How would we modify the simulation to pick that up? Well, we go back and look at the simulation and, and ask ourselves, well, what what are we really looking at? And keep in mind that each one of these lines in Simulink we call them signals, actually represents a physical variable in time. And if we can identify what those variables are, it makes it a lot easier to see how we modify our system. So for example, as we look at this block diagram, we realize that the outputs of these integrators are marked by the by what we've named the integrator block. So velocities on this line, displacements on this line, right? And um, this line here is, is the summation of forces, right? So this is summation of forces divided by mass, so that's acceleration. So if we realize summation of forces is in here, that gives us the clue we need to know how we, we add an external force into it. We just have to add it into the summing junction. So let's do that. Let me pull up Simulink. So what we want to do is, is add a force in here. And to do that, we have to find something to generate a force. So I'm going to, we're going to look at several different um, ways to generate a force. Excuse me while I make sure we get our boundaries set. OK, good. Uh, I'll start with a constant, because that's one of the commonly used blocks. So a constant in Simulink is something different than a gain. And, and, and there's some jargon here that's worth kind of paying attention to. A constant is a constant signal. A gain is a coefficient. So what we might call a constant, like the mass, is really a parameter, or in this case, a gain factor. So this is a constant um, signal, in this case, a constant force. So we'll, um, so we have a constant value of 1. We'll call it the force. OK. And now we want to add it into the summing junction. But there's no there's no place for it, right? So we double click and say, okay. Turns out there's as many inputs as there are plus or minus signs in here. And so what I'm going to do is click over to the beginning and just add another plus sign to the summing junction. And MATLAB does something pretty annoying. It um, it keeps it it does not do a good job of of uh, rerouting the lines. So I'm going to have to delete all the lines and put those back in. So we, have, we still have the, the damping force uh, coming in as a negative sign, the spring force as a negative sign, and put that in there as a positive sign. So in by adding a block and modifying an existing block, we've now changed this, um, this simulation to run um, from an external input. So let's set the initial conditions to zero. Uh, and remember, there's as many initial conditions as there are integrators. And let's run this simulation. And uh, our little bell tells us that it's done. I have to go find where it put my scope. It's right here. Um, and we need to 
reset the scale. So it was an input of one of one newton. And remember, the spring has a stiffness of a thousand uh, newtons per meter. So not surprisingly, the actual size of the displacement is pretty small. Um, so we started with a with a, a, a system that's at rest, and at time t equal to zero, that force suddenly came upon it. So it's kind of like well, it is a step input, though it's a little bit of a misnomer because it looked like it was a constant value we put in here. So let's be a little more explicit about it. Let's go back to the library browser and say, okay, what are my options? So going away from the commonly used blocks, you can see the way these blocks are organized there by, um, say, let's say the continuous values, that's where you'll find integration or things like um, state space models. You can implement an entire space, space, state space model in a single block transfer functions, controllers, and the like. Um, we have discontinuities, which will come in interesting later, things like uh, Coulomb friction or a dead zone or a, uh, a relay. Um, and there are various math operations we'll talk about in a bit. But the real interesting ones here, we're going to look at sources and sinks. So sinks are things the signals go to, usually to display or to store values. Um, and sources are just that they're the big they're the sources of some kind of a signal or input so we we were using the constant as a source let's modify that let's make it a uh, a step function instead step input so if you open up a step input you'll see it it tells you at what time the step will happen uh, what the initial value is what it is before that step time and what it is after so this by default it'll take a step at one second It'll, and it'll step from 0 to 1. So we'll do that. And we'll see a result that looks very similar to what we saw before, except for the fact that we now see that there was a period of time before the step uh, up to 1 second, and then the step happened at 1 second, and now it goes on to f for 50 seconds. So we can now control that and make the step any time we want and any size we want. So it's a little more versatile. So let's look at what, what other uh, signals we might be able to use. So going back to our library browser on the sources um, page, we can go to the signal generator. So I'll drag that over, I'll delete the step input, I'll put in the signal generator, and we can try all sorts of different signals. But let's try a square wave, which is just a series of step inputs, frequency of one radian per second. Uh, let's make that, yeah, that's pretty slow. That's That, that should work nicely. So hit that. Pull up our our uh, our um, scope, and we see that the input is a series of basically steps up and down, and we see uh, the response is somewhat predictable. It's it's a step input. It rings for a while, and then it it doesn't quite finish. It doesn't come close to finishing. It doesn't settle out yet, and then drops down to a to a to a minus one step, and then rings for a while. It might be a little clearer if we give it a little more damping and watch it watch it um, kind of ring out. So instead of a damping of one, I'll give it a damping of five, and uh, that's better. It's certainly not. Uh, yeah, you can start seeing it settle down, uh, and and get the results there. We can try a different waveform, try a uh, square wave, I'm sorry, a saw, sawtooth wave. And uh, that's very interesting. So sawtooth wave is a, is a step up and then a ramp down and a step up and a ramp down. And so you're seeing that ringing effect uh, really, really showing itself there. Um, to get a better look at that, let's make the damping even higher. Kick that up to 10. And uh, and see, yeah, so we can see that triangle uh, or the sawtooth wave showing up very clearly that way. So that's how we look at various various inputs. Let me take this back to where it was with a B of one. So so we talked about modifying an existing simulation and changing the inputs. Now let's look at where we might store the results of the simulation. So we looked at an oscilloscope, but we might want to want to kind of run those results to a um, to the workspace and then and then graph them in the workspace or do other operations on them because that's you know because MATLAB is a very powerful environment so let's go back to our simulation in our library browser and we'll go to the sinks page which is where information goes and it turns out um, there is a two workspace block and I'll put that down here 
and I'll say let's just store the displacement in there okay so and um, let's double click on here and see what our options when we look at this so we can give it a variable name we'll call it, we can, it defaults to something called sim out but I'll call it uh, DISPL displace for displacement um, no limit on how big it is we don't we're not really worried too much about that this is this is um, where you have a choice here so again this is I, I mentioned something at the very beginning how MATLAB and and MathWorks keeps adding more and more features onto these systems it used to be that was just a variable that you could just find in the workspace now they have these structures so I'm gonna um, select structure with time because I know how to manipulate that in the workspace we'll talk about what that means in a second hit OK hit run take a look at our results um, I'm clearly still looking at a um, a sine wave or I'm sorry a, um, a triangle I'm clearly looking at a, a, a sawtooth let's go back to a step or a square wave I mean and make the frequency small okay so basically in 50 seconds we only saw uh, a step down and a step up and uh, we see that so if I pull up my MATLAB window at this point I see um, over here uh, under the workspace panel I can see I've got two variables here DISPL that was the two workspace and T out which is a variable which is just a single column of 1973 elements and that's the time those are the, the times at which the um, the 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 simulation created data okay so there's 1973 in there to explore the um, the structure I'm going to double click on here and it says okay this structure has three fields one called time and look it's got the same size as the uh, as the T out so it's the, it's it is carrying the same information and in it there's another structure called signals and then there's something called block name so if I look at the signals I've got values dimension and labels so so um, values and time tell me tells me gives me the information I need let me show you how we'd use that and I'll do that in a plot command so I say plot and I want to have the first variable is time all right so I DSPL let me get that can I get that out of there I guess not DISPL dot time okay so that was one of the fields in that structure so DISPL dot time gives me the, the time uh, field DISPL dot uh, signals dot values gives me the, the the displacement the thing that I'd that I'd sent to that to workspace so this should give me a nice clean MATLAB style pl plot of displacement over time for that square wave response and uh, sure enough bring it over here take a look at it and it's the same thing we saw on the oscilloscope okay so we can we can modify the graph a little bit by adding a grid to it that sometimes makes it easier to see and I can label things so I can say X label for the X axis and that's time in seconds let's see what that looks so far so see what I did here hmm. where'd the grid go there's the grid okay there's a grid there there's the X label we can do the same thing for the Y label displacement in meters and so that shows up on there so that's that's you know a little bit of another few tricks and and uh, tips for MATLAB let me give you one more before we move on we'll go back to the simulation if I want to put that into a word document I can use the print command with the um, qualifier D meta so so it's dash D M E T A I hit that and it doesn't look like anything happens what it did it was it created a really high quality plot in um, uh, on the clipboard so it created a high quality plot plot on the clipboard 
and if I, I'll sort of, for example, I bring up a blank Word document, and if I hit Control V, there it is. So you see, it's a really nice, clean plot that you can then move around and edit and stretch any way you want, scale it, um, and so that's that makes for really nice reports. Okay, so um, let's go back to our simulation. Actually, let's go back to um, PowerPoint, right? So we've 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 now set signals to the workspace and plotted in the workspace. So now let's look at setting the parameters in the workspace. So let's let's bring up our simulation here and say, okay, instead of just putting the numbers of the parameter values directly into that, let me um, let me create a variable name. So we'll call that mass. We'll call that B and we'll call that K. And what Simulink does is when it before it runs this simulation, when you when you press the button to say run, it goes and says, okay, is there anything in these gain blocks or any of the other blocks that I need to have numbers for? And so if it sees uh, alphanumerics in those fields, it then goes to the workspace and looks for variables of that name. So if I were to run it now with that, it creates an error, right? And says, you know, um, you've got these things called um, mass here and we've got this thing called B and this thing called K and they're not defined so you need to go ahead and define those and we will indeed we'll go into our uh, MATLAB window and so we could do something as simple as say mass equals 0 0.1 B equals 1 K equals a thousand you see them showing up now in our workspace and now we can run it and it runs fine there's our there's our output again so that's working that's fine and that's kind of neat because now we can do things in our workspace that'll affect the the simulation um, it can also get a little tedious so as soon as you start doing that the first thing you want to do is is create a, a script file that will automatically define these things for you so let me pull up my um, the script I wrote to do this. So it's a very simple script. Mass equals 0.1, B equals 1.0, K is equal to 1000. And I called it start mod 06. So start the model for 06. Um, and, and I just want to point out a few things here and the, we'll see this in the slides as well, that um, there's certain conventions for, for good documentation. So I gave the name of the file in, the, in, these, in these header comments, the date I wrote it, um, and just a quick description of what it means. Kind of like self-documenting the, the simulation by changing the block titles. You really want to kind of leave yourself a bread trail because you're going to come back to this a month or two months later and say, what the heck did I, did I mean? And you can run it. And like I just did, it, and it didn't change anything because I didn't change the values, but now it, it defines that. So as long as you remember to run the, this script, before you run the simulation, it'll be defined. And then you can change things. You can say, okay, I'm going to make the mass or the stiffness a tenth, a tenth as stiff, right? And um, as long as you remember to run it. Let me bring up my simulation. Now, if I run this again, it, the response will be a lot more sluggish, right? It'll be a, a slower natural frequency and um, but a bigger displacement because it's the less stiff spring. So indeed, those are the two things we saw. So so that's great. That works really well. Let me show you one more trick of the trade, which is that I kept saying, how many times did I say you have to remember to run that script to change the parameter values? Wouldn't it be nice if you could link it so anytime you ran that simulation, you would run the script? Easy to do. Okay, so go into your simulation and under File, model properties choose model properties and now we have this this dialog box which tells you some information about when it was done and has it been modified and things like that but there's this concept called callbacks let me talk a little bit about what a callback is okay so a callback is a generic term used in computer simulation and object-oriented programming particularly that's an automatic action associated with something that goes on uh, that the user does okay and a, the best example of a callback is what happens when you when you click on something click on a when the, you use your mouse to click on an icon there is there are callbacks associated 
with that icon. Uh, one that if it's a single click, it usually just changes the color. It changes, makes it highlighted, right? If it's a double click, it usually then the callback then executes whatever that icon is associated with. So um, callbacks are really powerful concept, and MATLAB uses these periodically. They're kind of buried. They're really for expert users. So this might be your first and maybe even only example of a callback, but it's it's worth getting to know them. So I just walked you through this, right? You go to the uh, model properties. Um, under the file menu in your simulation window, hit, hit the callback, hit the callbacks tab, and now we see all these different operations that can happen in a simulation, in a simulating simulation that you can associate a callback with. The one, the only one we're interested in is this init FCN, and um, we go to the file menu, go to the model properties, and um, go to callbacks. And what you see here is I've already set this up. So this you can see under init FCN, there's an asterisk there. And I just put the name of the, the, the script, not without the dot M, just the name of the file without the extension. So start mod dot six is in there. And if I run it, um, it works. Okay, so that's the, um, that's the last trick I'm gonna show you in this, in this part of the module. We talked about modifying the simulation. We talked about changing the inputs. We talked about storing the files to the workspace and plotting from the workspace. Um, and we talked about um, how to control the parameters from within uh, the workspace and, and to help and to, and to create a script file to define the parameters and then associate that script file with your simulation. Those are really powerful. And as your simulations get very complicated, um, you will be very grateful you did it this way. So, um, so that's what we're that's what we've done in part three. One more part in this in this um, in this module, and that's working with nonlinearities, uh, which is again that's what we mentioned from the very outset that nonlinearities is why we deal with um, simulations in the first place. So it's very powerful. So uh, we'll see you in a minute. Mm -hmm.